All right, guys. So today we are taking a look at women's suffrage. Uh, this is a really important topic. It's a really big topic. Uh, and in order to understand this, you've got to know that uh, this didn't happen all within the, the parameters of the progressive movement. It happened many years prior to that. So we have to take a little bit of a look back in order to understand where it begins. Uh, it first starts to grow really alongside the abolition movement. And so as people are, as, as women especially, are fighting for uh, freedom from slavery and, and for those sorts of things, they're also starting to realize uh, that there's a kinship there, that they want equal rights as well, and they start to fight for those alongside. There's a little bit of a split in the movement, and out of that split is going to uh, we're going to see the creation of what's called the Seneca Falls Convention. Now, the Seneca Falls Convention is really what I like to call the starting pistol for the women's rights movement. It kicks off that suffrage movement. Uh, it was organized by a couple of women by the name of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. And they are the grand matriarchs, right? They are the, the ones that really kind of started it all. Uh, out of that organization, or, or out of that conference, I should say, they're going to create a document called the Declaration of Sentiments. And the Declaration of Sentiments is modeled very closely on the Declaration of Independence. So it's in a form, uh, and it's modeled after a document that we hold very dear, very close to our hearts. And instead of talking about the freedom of a, a country or a people, it's talking about freedom and equality of the sexes, uh, equality for women, very closely modeled after that Declaration of Independence. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is also going to work very closely with a good friend and confidant of her, hers uh, by the name of Susan B. Anthony. Now, that's a name we probably all recognize and, and know a little bit about, but this woman was incredible. She fought for abolition. She fought for temperance. The thing she's most known for, however, is her fight for suffrage. And uh, she's going to be one of the, again, another one of those grand matriarchs of the movement. Uh, now, I've said many times in, in these videos that for social change to take place, there really has to be one, awareness, and two, organization. And she's going to be a master of both. She's going to help to organize and get the word out about the need for women's suffrage through her organizations. Ultimately, it's going to be called the National American Women's Suffrage Association. It had a couple of different names, and there were splits in ideology and uh, different tactics. But when they come back together, this one large organization, and it's not the only one, but it was by far the largest, uh, becomes very, very influential. Her organization, uh, the National American, National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, right, uh, is going to grow to, at its height, over 2 million members. And uh, they're going to be in every state and territory in the country with over 1,000 chapters. So a lot of nationwide organization, organization at the state level, and then of course, certainly at the local level. They're gonna use a lot of different tactics and techniques in order to push their agenda. They'll use rallies, they'll, they'll have marches. They're gonna lobby politicians. They're gonna do awareness campaigns and do things like write letters to the editor and publish newspaper articles and, and write in magazines all towards the goal of women's suffrage and talking about equality. They're also going to be very supportive of sympathetic candidates. If they find somebody that they believe will be sympathetic to their, uh, their cause, even though they can't vote them into office, they will support their candidacy uh, by donating money. These organizations all collect dues uh, and contributions, and then they'll use those in lawsuits and charitable or, um, uh, campaign contributions and so forth uh, in order to further the cause. Now, those are all pretty normal tactics, and usually things are very peaceful within this movement. Uh, however, as the decades go on, uh, younger generations of suffragettes uh, become a little bit frustrated uh, that, that at the slow rate of change. And so they're going to resort to becoming a little bit more radical, a little bit more extreme. Now, nothing super violent, uh, but they're going to be uh, willing to go on things like hunger, strike, hunger strikes, and use civil disobedience. They're not afraid to get arrested if their arrest will bring publicity for their cause. Alice Paul was a fantastic example of this. She was one that a lot of people looked at as being very radical, but her radical actions really brought a lot of uh, publicity to the cause, inspired a lot of people. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, again, going back to her, uh, not what we would necessarily call a radical by today's standards, but she does get arrested for illegally voting in the 1872 
presidential election. She walks right up there with her ballot, puts it in the ballot bo box, and immediately gets arrested. Her ballot is uh, nullified, and she's given a $100 fine, a fine that she refused to pay, which brought more publicity. Uh, ultimately, the government kind of let the charges slide because they didn't want to bring any more heat on this issue. Uh, but, uh, but again, we're seeing things get a little bit more uh, radical in some places. Now, as they get closer to their goal of achieving suffrage, as, as they are making progress in that way, you'll also start to see opposition groups emerge uh, trying to stem the tide, trying to hold it back. So here we have the headquarters of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage. There were people that believed that women were not educated enough to make smart choices when it comes to the ballot, uh, that they weren't following politics closely enough. Uh, there were also those that believed that it gave married men an advantage because surely the married men will direct the votes of their, their wives, whereas single men only get their vote. Uh, what a ludicrous thing to think, right? Uh, but that was the, the thinking of some, that was the argument of some that were against it. Now, here's what I absolutely love. Most movements uh, in this country really have kind of started on the East Coast. Geographically, that's where we settle first, and then we move further and further west. And most movements do the same thing. Urbanization first takes place kind of on those eastern seaboard cities. Great education. All of our Ivy League is over that way. Um, and, and you might think that the idea of women's suffrage and equal rights starts in the urban areas or starts in, in the halls of academia. It doesn't. Where we see it first take root is out west, uh, which is kind of contrary to our thinking, right? We would think of, of out west being kind of a bastion of mas masculinity, right? Uh, the cowboys and, and just very defined gender roles. The reality is life out west was really, really difficult. And so men and women went together uh, and they had different roles, but both roles were challenging, and it took both the men and the women of the family in order to get things done and eke out an existence and start a homestead and do those sorts of things. Because of that, the West recognized the role that women had and granted them the right to uh, vote in territorial elections, local elections. And then when they become states, uh, it's the states that first allow them to vote. Now, not in presidential elections, because that's more of a nationwide thing, right? but at the, the local and state level. In fact, Wyoming was the first. And I'm gonna zoom in on this just so that you can see, right? 1869 is when Wyoming first gives women the vote. Uh, other states will follow suit out West well before uh, 1900, but it's not gonna be until 1919 uh, that we start to see some of these other states that in the East really come in 1917, 1918, uh, before they really begin to come on board. Uh, a good, you know, 20, 30 plus years after some of our states in the West. In fact, Wyoming applied for statehood and Congress uh, told them, we'd be happy to have you as a state, but you must first repeal women's right to vote. Uh, we can't have Wyoming women voting in presidential elections when others can't. Sets a bad precedent, right? It would cause problems. And the, the, the men of Wyoming that were the elected uh, leaders sent a telegram back that basically said, thanks, but no thanks. When we come into the union, we're bringing our women with us. I love that, right? That, what a cool thing. Uh, but we see it first out West. Um, now, the movement is going to grow. It's going to pick up steam. Tens of thousands of women are going to march in parades in cities all across the country as the movement picks up speed. And uh, we'll see the 19th Amendment gets proposed. President Wilson could have played a bigger role, if we're honest. Uh, he was not really a supporter of women's rights. And here we see them kind of questioning his support. He gave it lip service. Uh, he, he only gave lukewarm support to this thing uh, until it benefited him politically to do so. Because uh, Teddy Roosevelt at the time, his political opponent, was a strong supporter of uh, women's suffrage. So all of a sudden now Wilson was in for women's suffrage because uh, he thought it might win him some votes. In the end, he does support it, but uh, just moderately, right? Um, so anyway, when it finally does pass, it's the 19th Amendment. Uh, it passes in 1919, that's when it's ratified. And so women are able to vote in their very first ever presidential election 
in the election of 1920. And that kind of brings the, the, the suffrage movement. Now, that does not bring an end to uh, the movement of women's rights. Uh, that's something that is going to be ongoing. Uh, but the suffrage movement is over, uh, and we see it last really 100 years, uh, a long-suffering kind of thing. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. And uh, feel free to leave me comments. There are a lot of women that I left out. There are a lot of events that I left out. Please let me know if there's something you think you'd like me to add. Uh, or if you have any questions, I, I'll get back with you. Uh, until then, please go ahead and subscribe. And thanks for watching, guys.